This will be part two of my two-part lecture on the album titled Hikoen, The Garden Plowed by the Brush, a 60-leaf album of miscellaneous old paintings, uh, mostly of those types that I described in one of my earlier lectures as Sogenga, literally meaning Sungran paintings, but a term used for paintings of the, of the Sungran period as preserved in Japan, paintings of a type, many of them not, not preserved in China so we know them only through Japanese collection. The album, as I said last time, is in the Tokyo National Museum, and I made slides from it there, original slides with lots of details, uh, back in the 1980s when I was able to see it for the first time, shortly after they had acquired it. The images from these slides are the basis for this lecture then, which will be about leaves 31 through 60. The 31st leaf is a landscape attributed to Xiao Gui, and one with which everybody who has followed this series should be familiar. If you don't recognize this one immediately, you fail the course and you have to take it over again. Next, please. I'm sorry to say that I don't seem to have a slide of the whole painting, uh, although I'm sure I made one. It was lost or it was fed into the departmental collection anyway. This. Um, slide so this uh, image of the whole was made from a reproduction and it will serve for our purpose. Because I do have good detail images, most of which uh, we've seen already, but they're worth looking at again. Next. First, the house beneath leafy trees on the water's edge, toward which the figure seen in the lower right is returning, presumably in the evening. This is then one of the many scenes of returning that I spoke about at length as a type in one of the lectures as part of the program underlying, I think, so much of Southern Song painting of landscapes with figures. That is the program I call The Lyric Journey, also the title of my book in which is discussed at length. So again, I can only show the picture, point out again that all the brush drawing is totally free of idiosyncrasies and scarcely can be called brushwork at all. If we think back to the old argument uh, made in by, in the Northern Sung period by uh, theorists of that time and earlier about how the artist should create the way nature does without purpose. We can see that that difficult goal here is finally achieved. Next, next please. <clears throat> the ridge above with a further building seen between leafy trees. Uh, if we try to imagine painting such a picture, achieving a total avoidance of brushwork, the kind of self-expressive or self-assertive brush mannerisms that we see in the works of the scholar amateur painters, we can, we can come closer to appreciating the quiet achievement of this artist. Next, please. Uh, the lower right, where the weary farmer or whatever he is, is seen about to cross a bridge, slightly bent over with fatigue, but plodding patiently on, nearing home. Even the application of din or dotting is modest and restrained. Next, please. Closer in. The simple rendering of the water as it pours under the bridge and swirls between banks is just right, as is everything in the, in the painting. All the old Taoist beliefs about skill that is no skill, achievement free of purposefulness, seem ideally exemplified here. Next, please. The signature seen in this detail that I haven't shown before is problematic. The surname Xia is clear enough, but the character written below is unclear. It would be hard to make it read as Gui. So the real authorship of this painting has to be left a bit mysterious. Still, the style clearly is that of Xia Gui, and at least until the signature is deciphered, we may as well accept the work as his. Next, please. Leaf 32 is attributed to none other than Mu Qi, once more without any solid basis, and it represents a monkey lying on a bank by the water and reaching down next. Seen here in my slide image, the monkey is probably meant to be reaching for the reflection of the moon in the water. A large seal in the lower left may be a Muchi seal, I can't read it, and a smaller seal in the lower right. About the subject, images of monkeys are used to parody human behavior especially unseemly desire, reaching out for things beyond one's grasp. Next, please. In one of the 500 Arhat paintings from the late 12th century in the Daitokuji, the Arhats are seen gazing upward 
at monkeys in the trees. The image is unclear, but I think it represents the mother clutching her child and the father reaching out for something, probably a fruit. The point of the picture is the superiority of spiritual enlightenment, uh, the absence of worldly desire over these human failings. Next. Monkeys are represented wrong-armed, which makes this theme of reaching out all the more striking. This one reaches upward for some unspecified object. Paintings of this genre are often ascribed to Muchi, which may explain the attribution of the hiko and leaf. Next. Another one in which the mother monkey, or gibbon properly, hangs from a tree branch with one arm while reaching out for something with the other. The young monkey, shown here as white in color, clings to the mother. The only image of this kind reliable from Muchi's hand, the great painting in the Daitokuji triptych, which I talked about at great length, transcends this kind of simple meaning and presents an enigmatic but challenging image. All these others, including the Hiko and leaf, are entertaining but less serious. Next. The 33rd leaf is one familiar to us, but with a different attribution. In the Hiko and album, it's ascribed to Li Tang. It's a fan-shaped leaf, a landscape with an ox and ox herd entering the water, the calf coming from right to join the mother, all this set in a landscape. Next, please. A landscape that's more in the style of Xiao Gui than of Li Tang. In fact, I showed this leaf in the lecture on Xiao Gui as a possible work by him. It was included in the exhibition of Southern Song Painting in Japan, from which I copied the reproduction, as a work by Xiao Gui, a new attribution based convincingly on its style. This is the image made from my slide. Next, please. And this is the image shown before, copied from the color plate in the Southern Song Exhibition Catalog. This is a good example of a reattribution based on style, an entirely legitimate practice when it's carried out with a good eye for style as it is as it was here. Such reattribution by style or recognizing the hand of the artist are of course commonplace in the much more highly developed field of European old master painting. They enable the formation of an oeuvre, or a body of extant work for the artist. Next, please. This detail among the refound slides doesn't tell us much more about the painting. We can see the herd boy more clearly, and the reeds along the shore, which now look more like green spreads of bamboo leaves. Uh, the vegetation on the shore is deliberately reduced to an unrevealing expanse of dotting. Still, this detail adds to our store of visual images for these paintings, which need and need to be included, even though I have little to say about it. Next, please. Leaf 34 is a square leaf, representing an old tree on the shore, and is attributed to Liang Kai. The attribution is based entirely on style, but, next, when we see the leaf in a better image, this one made from my slide, the attribution appears in this case to make sense. In the lecture on Liang Kai, Lecture 11D, we looked at several signed works by Liang Kai that are related to this one in composition. A single object in the lower right corner, a figure in one of them, a man in a boat in another, a stretch of water occupying the intervening space, a dimly seen further shore. The old tree leans out over the water. Another tree grows beside it, curving outward before shooting straight up to divide into small branches at the top. The opposite shore is mostly hidden in fog, giving the whole picture an air of mystery, of drawing the eye into depths where nothing can be discerned. This picture truly merits serious consideration. It's quite possibly a work by Liang Kai. Next. Leaf 35 is another of those simple compositions representing things in a basket or laid out on leaves. We saw one already in leaf 14 with grapes and melons, and we'll see another leaf 39 of beans in a glass dish. This time it's a peony in full bloom, along with others beginning to open and several at right shown as tight buds. Next. These together with the pictures of shells seen before make up an interesting hitherto unrecognized group that deserves serious consideration as a type of popular picture produced, we can suppose, in some particular place or region in Sung Yuan times by anonymous craftsman artists. 
and representing, as I said before, what is essentially a kind of folk art, like Otsue in Edo period Japan. Next, please. Paintings of this kind are preserved in China only rarely, when they bear a signature or attribution that supplies the big name that Chinese collectors demanded. In this case, it's an interpolated signature of Li Sung, seen in the lower left. This is an original slide image of the painting in the Palace Museum, Beijing, that I've previously shown in one made from a reproduction. Uh, it's another picture of flowers in a basket, this one much more lavish and elaborate in composition. But the two baskets resemble each other, and this is probably only the more expensive version of the same, costing maybe 20 cents instead of 10, whatever. Uh, we can imagine that the paintings were sold beside stalls where the things represented were themselves for sale, shells or vegetables or flowers and baskets and dishes to buy and take home. All this, of course, is imagination, but I believe it's imagining in the right direction. Next, please. Leaf 36 is a fan-shaped picture of chickens in a garden setting, and like the similar compositions with cats and dogs, it's ascribed to Mao Yi, an attribution that makes better sense than most of the others. Next. It appears, in fact, to add another, still another, to the group of compositions of this type, representing mother and child groups or whole families of creatures seen occupying the space in front of garden rocks with flowering plants behind them. The painting of cat and kittens and the one of bitch and puppies described to Maui in the Yamato Bunkakan in Japan, both of them seen before, are the finest of the group and the ones against which the others should be compared and judged, most of them unfavorably. Still, this leaf adds a new subject to the group, the proud-looking cock and the concerned-looking hen with their large brood or family, eleven chicks scattered about the ground pecking up bits of grain. The flowers are in full bloom, and two small white butterflies are in the air. One can imagine how the popularity of themes of this kind, both entertaining and instructive, that is instructive because of what we would call family values that they represent, led to their being produced in multiples, within the court, and by copyists and imitators outside it. Next, please. Leaves 37 through 39 in Hikkoen are all ascribed to Run Yue Shan, or Run Run Fa, a well-known Yuan period artist who served in the Mongol government and was best known for paintings of horses. The attribution of all three, uh, all three of these uh, seems arbitrary without any solid foundation. His is another famous name uh, that's attached to old paintings to give them more value. Leaf 37 depicts an arhat sitting on a large rock and confronting a serpent, unafraid of it. We saw two pictures of arhats with serpents before, one at the end of the Fan Lung scroll and the other in a painting by Mu Chi. This is an unusually finished and complex composition among the Hikkoen leaves and it's quite possibly uh, taken from a longer scroll made up of a series of pictures of Arhats and their attendants. This one is in fact based on one of the series that exists in other versions, the oldest and finest of these being an important Sung painting that's in the Palace Museum in Beijing, ascribed to the Tang Dynasty master Lu Jia, but really a fine Sung painting. Other parts in the same series are copied at the beginning of the Fan Lung scroll, the seated arhats and attendants. These could all be assembled and made the subject of a special study of arhat paintings. For the most part, I'm leaving them out of my lectures as part of the large area of Buddhist painting in which I'm really uh, especially weak, so I'm not talking much about it. Nevertheless, this leaf and the older and better painting in Beijing offer an opportunity which I'll take to show the differences between an old and fine painting of this subject and a later version. I found, by the way, a group of slides from the Lulang Jia attributed work just as I was preparing this lecture. They're not slides of the whole scroll, but rather arbitrary, but they fortunately include the uh, section, the Arhat, corresponding to the one in the Hiko and Li, which I'll show. Next, please. In the left part of the Hiko N leaf, a young monk comforts a boy who is frightened by the serpent and who hides his face in the monk's robe. 
A lay figure holding a long pole of some kind stands behind them. Something I can't identify lies on the ground in front of them. Next. In both paintings, the Arhat sits in perfect calm, untroubled by the fearsome things that he confronts. A dragon in the case of the Lulangjia picture, a serpent in the Hikoen leaf. The Arhat is made impervious, that is, to harm by his spiritual power. The serpent and the dragon rear up in front of him as if to strike. Next, please. The dragon in the Lulang Jaw scroll has its jaws open and its tongue protruding. It's an especially fine dragon image. A whole scroll painting, as some of you know, a wonderful work by the late Song specialist in this subject, Chun Rung, is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and can be seen there. This is one of the many specialist subjects in Sung painting that I'm not treating. Next, please. In the Hikoen leaf, the Arhat's robe is drawn in the archaic parallel fold manner, originally taken from sculpture, probably, and distantly derived from religious images in, southern, in Central Asian sites. He smiles slightly, and his unkempt hair sticks out at the sides. This is truly an engaging image, anecdotal and spiritual at the same time. It seems more a popular image, which uh, much as might end up in the Hikoen album, in contrast to the scroll attributed to Lulang Jia, which is the highly finished Sung Academy manner and larger in scale, so that it was preserved in China. I will show a few more images from that, from my newly found slides, which, as I say, don't show the whole picture, but just uh, r random, uh, random details from it, uh, before going on. Next, please. Another arhat from the Beijing scroll, this one seated and leaning forward. A glass bowl with two white peonies is on the bamboo stand beside him. Here's a clue to how these ornamental objects were placed. The drawing of the arhat's head, arms and hands, and feet is especially form-defining and fine, representing a height of this kind of painting in China. Next, please. For something really comparable, I show this detail, which we saw before in Lecture 9, from a painting ascribed to the Southern Sung Academy master Liu Sung Nian, and that, I think, is the proper place to put the Lu Lung Jia attributed scroll. Uh, it's another example, if one were needed, of Southern Sung Academy painting as representing the pinnacle of representational achievement within the whole history of Chinese painting. And as I've said over and over, it's past time for this achievement to be recognized for what it is. Next, please. Two more images from slides of the Lulang Jia attributed painting, not chosen uh, but by me, but just chance finds. I found, as I say, a group of slides by accident. Uh, I must have a complete set of slides from the scroll somewhere in Berkeley, but I'll let these few serve to, uh, at least to uh, arouse your interest in it. Quite a few institutions have sets of slides uh, of the slides uh, copied from the ones we made in China. And the Asian Art Photographic Service at the University of Michigan, I'm sure, can supply copies of them. So you go there if you want the whole thing. Again, we can admire in these, quite apart from the figure painting, the meticulous rendering of the furniture designs, the textile patterns, and the objects shown, some of them unidentifiable, at least by me. Next, please. Two more details from the Lulang Jia attributed scroll. Paintings of this kind can be used as visual evidence for Sung material culture, along with excavated or preserved objects of Sung date. I myself have never been especially drawn to studies of that kind, although I did curate an exhibition of Southern Sung art for Asia House Gallery in New York in 1962 that included objects but I had to depend on my collector friends, such as Johnny Falk and uh, Frederick Mayer, for help in their uh, selection, that is, of objects. The next, please. The end of the scroll with the fake Lulang Jia signature. After the character Jin, meaning advanced or presented to the emperor, uh, this was written onto a fine painting of Arhats to give it a spurious early attribution. But in the close-up detail seen beside it, from elsewhere in the scroll, one of the attendant figures holds a large fan, and the painting on it might give us a clue. 
as so often it does with paintings within paintings of this kind, a clue to the real date of the scroll. A landscape with pine tree and distant hill, it would appear to date around the end of Sung, when, as I have said many times, court artists were put to work making copies of old paintings in the imperial collection, so that these copies preserve compositions of works for which the originals are lost. This is such a case. Now at last I end this long digression and return to the Hiko N album. The next, please. Leaf 38 in it is a fen-shaped painting of figures in a palace garden with green ornament, ornamental rocks in foreground, middle ground, left, and distance. The man on horseback is the Tang Emperor Minghuang, seen here with some of his palace women and eunuchs. The picture is one of a pair, both of which exist in different versions, the other one representing Minghuang watching a cockfight, again in a palace setting. From my notes on these and where the different versions can be found, uh, see pages 120 to 121 of my index, Index of Early Chinese Paintings, um, under Li Sung, to whom they are sometimes attributed. See also the article by Ellen Lang, titled Li Sung and Some Aspects of Southern Sung Figure Painting, published in Artibus Asiae for 1975. I'm doing some of this partly from memory, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Artibus Asiae 1975. Very fine article. Some Southern Sung Academy master, quite likely Li Sung, originated the compositions, and they were popular and much copied so that versions survive from different periods and in different styles, notably a figure style associated with the early Yuan artist Liu Guandao. Another complicated set of problems of dating and attribution within a group of attractive paintings. Next, please. Seen in this detail, the painting of the figures reveals this to be a competent but undistinguished copy of an old composition. Pictures were endlessly copied to provide attractive images of popular subjects, such as life in the Imperial Palace, and fan paintings were produced in particular numbers, mounted on fans in huge numbers for sale. Uh, the painting would later be removed, as I've uh, related several times, and mounted in albums. Uh, this is one such undistinguished copy of a well-known old composition. Next. Leaf 39 is still another of the type with which we are now familiar, showing shells on leaves, flowers and fruit, and vegetables in bowls and baskets. Here, seen only dimly in the woodblock printed reproduction, but clearly in the image from my slide, it is beans in pods with their leaves, all piled in a glass bowl. It's a small picture that has had additional strips of silk set around it to enlarge it. And again, it's in no particular style. It's more picture than painting, if we want to make that distinction. And it must have been the kind of small picture one could buy cheap and take home as a souvenir, as one takes posters and postcards home from visits to a fair or to some scenic place. Uh, these are only guesses, of course, but they are truer to the nature of the pictures, I believe, than any attempts to associate them with famous artists. Uh, they are by nobody, by nameless folk artists, in other words. Wondering whether these subjects can be seen also in the popular color prints produced later in China in the late Ming and early Qing periods, I looked through them and found, not surprisingly, yes, bowls and baskets of flowers and fruit, very similar, are to be seen in the popular prints produced in the Suzhou region. And I'll show a series of seven of these prints quickly all in the British Museum and reproduced in the catalog of the Exhibition of Pictorial Prints shown there last year, the exhibition organized principally by Clarissa von Spey, and these are taken from the catalog so quickly. In this picture of elegant object for the gentleman scholar study, a basket of flowers is seen in the lower center. Next, please. The elaborate basket in the lower left of this one is filled with flowers, a huge red peony, perhaps, and what appears to be lilies or daffodils. And next. In this one, in the lower right, a bowl with yellow glazed interior holds what appears to be a persimmon broken open to show the seeds, all set on broad leaves. Next. In this one, Buddha's hand fruit, 
and leaves in a bowl with blue crackled glaze. Next. Here we print quite close to our paintings and subject, showing a large red peony and other flowers and leaves with an elaborate basket. Next. The same block can be used with different colors to produce a print centered on a large yellow peony. This is printed later. The blocks are more worn. The last line of the inscription had disappeared. Next. Lotus pods with the blossoms and leaves arranged in a thin porcelain dish. Next, please. And finally for this series, a similar print with the bowl holding persimmons broken open and what appear to be peaches. The dishes in their stands are very similar in the two prints, differing mainly in color. The contents of the bowls are the main difference. Again, we can imagine the block carvers making only small adjustments in the designs of these parts, adding wholly new imp drawings for the fruits. All right, enough for that. Next, please. Uh, these prints are all some centuries later than the paintings, of course. My point is only that the practice of bringing home and arranging decoratively in baskets and bowls a diversity of plants and objects representing seasons and places continues over these centuries, and pictures of them continue to be popular. Here is a great research topic for somebody, maybe even a dissertation length. A lot of the images you'll need are provided in this lecture, because I've shown several paintings of this kind with comparative pieces. Next, please. Back to our album, and to the 40th leaf in it, which is attributed to Ma Lin. The fan-shaped painting might as well have been associated, have been ascribed to his father, Ma Yuan. Uh, it shows us, next please. It shows us a man standing at the railing of his garden with his boy servant, gazing out at a crane that has flown in, and now stands looking upward at, uh, into the night sky, where a yellow moon, this could be a Ma Lin touch, because a similar moon, yellow but smaller, appears in Ma Lin's Sitting Up by Lantern Light, a famous picture. A tiny spot of red is on the head of the crane. Next, please. But the subject and style of the leaf can be seen also in many works by Ma Yuan's numerous followers and imitators, such as this one. And there is no point in trying to attach an artist's name to such a picture. It represents a type, not an individual artist's style. We can admire and enjoy these pictures while suppress suppressing our artist RN's urge always to date and attribute. Next, please. Leaf 41 is attributed to the Yuan period artist named Run Kong Min, who is one of those unknown and unrecorded in China but mentioned in early Japanese sources. Two paintings in Japan are ascribed to him, this and another one. This one, through which I have no good slide image, is a landscape of a lake or river shore with leafy trees growing by the water, with flat shoals in the distance. All I can say about it is that the strong vertical cracking, seen clearly here even in the reproduction, indicates that it was originally part of a hand, hand scroll. This would account for the unusual composition which seems to have no structure or focus. Someone has cut a piece out of, a old, out of an old hand scroll, that is, and mounted it as an album leaf, or so I would understand it. Next, please. The 42nd leaf is more interesting. It's ascribed to Su Han Chun, the Southern School Academy master famous for his pictures of children, so that old examples are mostly ascribed to him. Next. This one represents a child putting on a hand puppet show behind a proscenium arch for two other children, one of whom beats on a drum to accompany the performance. I've shown this one already, along with a group of similar paintings, in one of the previous lectures. It belongs to the type that I've talked about several times, favored by masters of the Southern Tsung Academy, in which their subjects, human or animal, are set in gardens and backed by ornamental rocks and flowering plants. Next, please. A detail of this leaf shows us more. The two puppets appear to represent scholar officials, recognizable by their caps. We can read the sign, which reads, On Stage Today, and we can appreciate better the drawing of the figure at left, 
the boy with his hands resting on his upper legs, leaning forward as he concentrates his attention on the performance. We can see the designs on the coat of that boy and on the trousers of the seated one, and we can almost hear the sound of the drum. All in all, an excellent, an, an excellent and revealing little picture, which deserves to be reproduced and discussed in some book about Chinese puppetry. Next. Leaf 43 is a signed work, a winter landscape, by the late Song Academy master, Lo Guan, who followed Ma Yuan as a landscapist. The, la the text leaf miswrites his name as Gui Guan. The signature on the painting is correct. I recorded this painting in my index as a genuine work by Lo Guan. It's a wintry landscape in which a traveler on a donkey, seen in the lower right with his servant and two luggage carriers, approaches the gate of what is presumably his own dwelling. He must be returning home late from a trip. The pine trees and the large boulder at left, on which the signature is written, are indeed in the Maoyuan manner. Next, please. The drawing is rather thick and inflexible. This is more like a Yuan or early Ming copy than a Sung original, but it preserves the composition, at least, of an interesting fan painting with a subject belonging to a type that we saw in several Sung examples, the traveler on a donkey returning home, his servant walking before him with a staff, and his house seen beyond, open and welcoming him, with someone, perhaps his wife, half seen in the opening. The spots of white on the trees and the bamboo stand for snowfall. The failure of the stream in upper right to recede properly, uh, the heavy lines lie on the surface, reveals us to be a copy. No good artist would have drawn this distant recession meant to carry the viewer's eye back into depth in this heavy-handed way. Next. Leaf 44 is a signed work of the early Yuan master Shang Mo, the professional master who is sometimes set against Wu Zhan as an amateur. I wrote about them in that way in my old dissertation on Wu Zhan, but I later turned to finding Shang Mo the more versatile and interesting artist. Quite a few fine works by him survive. Next, please. Here is the image uh, from my slide, showing it to be painted in rich colors with heavy green on the landscape forms and red on the leafage of one of the trees, identifying the season as autumn. Shang Mo's signature and seal are on the lower left edge. For some reason that I don't recall now, I listed it in my index as an imitation. It's true that it exhibits less of Shang Mo's distinctive style than one would like. Those interested can compare it with a reproduction of a similar scene by Shang Mo on page 109 of my Scarab book. But in my more tolerant old age, I would leave the question of its authenticity open. It might be early or a minor work in which he exhibits less of his personal brushwork and forms. The wave pattern on the water is finely done, as is the bare old tree that overhangs the water. Next, please. Leaf 45 represents a man in a boat near the shore and is attributed to the late Song Academy master Wang Hui, not to be confused with the early Cheng Wang Hui, whose given name is written with a different character, probably pronounced with a different tone, but I can't manage tones. Okay, next, please. Seen here in the image from my slide, it reveals the reason I questioned the attribution in my index and suggested instead that it's a Yuan period work with Sheng Mo as the possible artist. In fact, if this leaf had been attributed to Sheng Mo instead of the previous one, I would have been willing to accept the attribution. The coloring and the texturing of the foreground bank and the distant hill are in Sheng Mo's distinct distinctive style. The man is relaxing in his boat on a spring evening beneath a bare willow and a blossoming tree that reveal the season. He holds some small cylindrical object that I can't identify. Things to eat and a wine pot are on the boat deck behind him. Next, please. Leaf 46 is attributed to another of the artists known only in Japan, unrecorded and unknown in China. His name is Hu Fu. 
The accompanying text miswrites it as Gujarfu. Gujarfu is right. And he seems to have been a late Sung artist who specialized in Buddhist figure paintings. Next one, please. This one depicts the theme of uh, Chao, Shaoyang, Chaoyang, sorry, or morning sunlight, a Chan Buddhist image presumably reflecting the Chan practice of mending robes by early morning light. Pictures of this title, of which I know several, uh, represent monks engaged in this occupation, as this one does. Uh, the strong, disconnected brushstrokes used for the robe don't belong properly to either Chan painting or the academy. The artist, whoever he was, may have been imitating Liang Kai's figure painting on a much lower level, of course. The next, please. The attribution of Lee 47, a landscape, is another example of something that we've seen more than once already, that is the fondness of the Japanese for attributing landscape paintings, quite arbitrarily, to Miyo Run. They had little understanding of how he really painted. There weren't any Miyo Run paintings in Japan until into the, well into the 20th century, and they didn't know that uh, these were quite outside and indeed somewhat beyond his capacity as an artist. Next, please. Choosing a more plausible artist to attribute the leaf to is difficult, since it doesn't exhibit the style characteristics of any artist I can think of. But we have to remember that there were countless small artists producing pictures in no style that became famous and notable enough for us to recognize it now. In the middle ground, a broad stream runs down over large rocks, uh, broadening still further as it flows into the foreground and joins a river, or is it a lake? Anyway, paralleling the stream is a path that runs across the whole composition, uh, passing beneath the grove of leafy and coniferous trees. A more distant forest is seen beyond at the foot of tall hills, and still further, peaks appear over those. Uh, some of the dien or dots attached to nearby forms appear to be of the type with a green dot placed over a larger one in ink, a type that we've noted in paintings of late Sung date. A picture that is mysterious without being especially notable, and I have said all that I have to say about it. Next, please. Leaf 48 represents waves on the water, and is ascribed to Ma Xingzu, son of Ma Fun, who is, who is the founder of the Ma family lineage in the Southern Xing Academy. Ma Xingzu was active in the 12th century under Emperor Gao, Gao Zhong. Next. The attribution seems to have no significance, unless it is that Ma Yuan painted scenes of water, as we saw, so that pictures of this subject may have been associated with his family. Uh, the upper part of the composition is oddly symmetrical, with the waves pushing in both directions from a central division. The whole effect is more decorative than representational. Next. Mayuan's own paintings of water, as this detail from one of them will serve to remind us, were much more convincing as visual responses to real surface phenomena of rivers and lakes. This is true also of the curving of the wave tips, or the curling of the wave tips, I mean, decoratively depicted in the Hiko N leaf, much more representational in Mayuan's painting. Next. Leaf 49 is another representing an arhat, an attendant. This one attributed to another of the artists known only in Yuan records and unknown in China. The early Japanese compilation titled Kundai Kan Sayu Choki uh, lists him as a painter of figures, including the Bodhisattva Guanyin. Next. This is the only painting attached to his name in my index, or I call it a fine sung work ignoring the attribution altogether. The old Arhat and his boy attendant stand leaning toward each other, the Arhat carrying a long staff. A simple indication of a river shore is seen beyond them. This is perhaps best thought of as a surviving fragment from some old painting of Arhats. It's hard to imagine it intended as a self-sufficient picture. Leaves 50 and 51 are both attributed to the Yuan artist Xiao Yong or Xiao Mingyuan, another of those who's recorded who are recorded in the Kundai Khan compilation in Japan, and unknown or nearly so in China, 
where fine line architectural paintings by him are ascribed falsely to more prestigious masters. I have a section on him in the article I mentioned earlier, written for last year's exhibition at the Shanghai Museum that included old Chinese paintings in Japan, in Japan. So you can read more about him there. Next, please. Neither of the two Hikkoen pictures is in the distinctive style of his signed works. So these are arbitrary attributions made simply because the pictures include prominent architecture. Both of them are painted with heavy color, whereas all of Xiao Yong's reliable works are in ink only on silk. Leaf 50, seen here in my slide image, is in the so-called gold and green manner, with gold outlines along landscape forms covered with heavy green, that is malachite pigment. Uh, paintings in this manner are more commonly, but equally wrongly, ascribed to Zhao Baoju. A figure in white is seen beneath a grove of heavily, co heavily colored leafy trees, and another with a red coat appears on horseback between this and the overhanging cliff. This too makes little sense as an independent composition, and it's probably a fragment cut from a larger picture. Next, please. Leaf 51, by contrast, is a well-composed, quite self-sufficient picture, fan-shaped and full of fine detail. In my index, I dated both these leaves to the early Ming and suggested an association with the artist Shi Rui, who was active then and did pictures of this kind. That still seems to me a pretty good guess for this leaf, although it could also be earlier. Many small identical figures are seen approaching a palace complex, standing in front of it or on its terraces. It's one of the many paintings that architectural historians could have significant things to say about. I certainly don't. Next, please. Leaf 52 is a more important leaf than most others in this album because it has been the subject of scholarship by none other than Shujiro Shimada. Its original attribution, as seen here in the accompanying text, is to the Yuan artist Gaoran Hui. He's another unknown in China but recorded in the Kundai Khan text. Quite a few paintings are ascribed to him, as you'll find in my index. He seems to have specialized in landscapes with Hills and Clouds. Next, please. Here is my slide from the reproduction. The picture does indeed belong to his, the, the type associated with the Gaoran Hui, but the leaf bears a brief inscription in the upper left, giving the artist's name as Manchur and dedicating it to a certain Boshur. And Manchur, as Shimada discovered, is the name used by an early Ming artist named Gao Ting Li who was a member of the Hanlin Academy in the Yung Lo era in the early Ming, and he painted landscapes in the manner of Mi Fu. So the painting is now recognized as a work of this Gao Ting Li. I myself am reproducing it again with an old article of mine coming out at last in the next issue of Archives of Asian Art, where I write about how this type of landscape with hills and clouds carried on in the Yuan by Gao, Ke, Gao Kegong was continued in the Ming not by the scholar amateurs, as Mi Fu and Gao Ke Gong had been, but by professional and academy masters, who painted hills and clouds pictures for their patrons because of the political meanings that they carried. I was also writing to counter the arguments of Japanese scholars that Seshu, when he visited China, must have come into contact with scholar amateur artists as well as with, with professionals since he sometimes uses the Gao Kegung manner in his landscape paintings. Uh, that manner, as I point out, was used by Ming professionals and just school artists, not by the scholar amateurs. Uh, these are matters of importance only to those of us seriously engaged in the field. Uh, they can read my article when it appears for the full argument. And um, the, these are matters that will be of little interest, I think, to others anyway. So here is the painting now uh, now identified as by Gao Ting Li, an interesting and accomplished picture. Next, please. A detail of this leaf doesn't reveal much more because the painting is done in a manner without fine detail. But it does show us the small rooftops at, at far right and allows us to appreciate more of the skill of the artist in playing on old conventions so as to make us read blurry passages 
as vegetation on the nearer shore or a winding stream and its banks and so forth. Viewers of the time would have seen this as a landscape in the Me family manner, but in fact it incorporates new advances in representation of space and masses, their surfaces blurred by atmosphere. The take us past what the two Me's could have done. A few markings in the center of this image leave me puzzled. Are they meant, are they meant to represent a figure, slightly bent and carrying something, maybe a chin? It would appear so, but I'm not sure. If so, it's a new and unexpected addition to this well-known leaf. Next. Back when we were looking at leaf 26 in this album, a painting of tall stalks of bamboo, I mentioned that paintings of this subject and style were usually attributed in Japan to an artist named Tanjirui, and that we would be seeing a leaf ascribed to him later in the album. Here it is, leaf 53, representing bamboo growing by rocks, all in mist. Next, please. Tanja Rui is still another of those recorded in the Kundai Khan catalog and uh, unknown in Chinese writings. But he is especially interesting and important among these artists because of the number and quality of the works attributed to him. The problem, which has led some to doubt the very existence of Tanja Rui, is that no painting exists within his with his reliable signature or seal on it. They are all attributions. Some of the paintings are inscribed by a monk named Yishan Ining, who was born in 1247, came to Japan in 1299, and died there in 1317. Next, please. One of these inscribed by Yishan, representing bamboo growing by rocks in snow, is this album leaf that the Freer Gallery bought, on my recommendation, in 1956. The, the variety of the types, bamboo and mist, bamboo and wind, bamboo and snow, uh, represented by uh, Tanja Rui, or the artist who painted these works at least, make this group especially attractive. It deserves another serious study, in addition to the Japanese scholarship on this artist that I cite in my entry on him and in my index. Next, please. This is another painting ascribed to him, also in the Freer collection, and this one is rep reproduced in my book, Hills Beyond a River. It doesn't appear, however, in the new website of Sungran paintings in the Freer, so it was evidently rejected as a work of that period by the compilers, who were, as I have said, heavily inclined toward Chinese attitudes as opposed to Japanese. Joseph Zhang and Yu Hui were influential figures among them. Anyway, it's a fine painting of the type, uh, showing tall bamboo and wind. And again, we can note the device of making the bamboo stalk similar in shape, but different in ink tonality, with the darkest one just to the right of center, and so forth. Next, please. Another painting of tall bamboo, this one formerly owned by the dealer Yanagi, is a larger painting in worse condition, of which I have only this less than ideal image. I must have in old notes information about the signed inscription in upper right, which might help us to date it, but my old notebooks aren't so easily searchable. A serious study of this group of paintings would, of course, take account of inscriptions and seals on them. The tall bamboo stalks are again graded in tonality to give depth to the group. Bamboo shoots and small sprigs are seen growing below. Next, please. This one, which I can show in a good image in detail, was owned by Howard Rogers and presumably sold by him to some museum or collector. My slide is dated 1985. Uh, the painting must be reproduced with a long and informative article by Howard accompanying it in his Kai Kodo journal around that year. Howard, who was once my student, does exhaustive scholarship on the paintings he handles as a dealer and makes this accessible, along with good reproductions, in his Kai Kodo journal. I recommend it as a source of detailed information on a great many paintings and their artists. Next. Leaf 54 is another painting of grapes. This one attributed, like most early grape paintings, to Ruguan. The one we saw earlier, Leaf 25, was ascribed to a different monk named Xiao An. Um, next. This one doesn't seem fine enough in quality to be a real work by Rurguan. The grapes are too uniform and flat, 
The leaves don't curl in space the way his do. It's another of the many works ascribed to him that can't be accepted as his work. The odd red mark in the upper right, which I can't quite make out, may be a smudge seal. You will find Rurguan in my index, by the way, under the name Wan or Tzu Wan. Rurguan was his how or studio name. Next, please. The most famous and one of the two most reliable great paintings by Rurguan is the one seen at left in a bad image made from a reproduction. I don't have a better one. It was formerly in the Inoue collection in Japan. I don't know where it is now. And it's reproduced in Soren, volume 3, plate 387, and in many other places. The date on it corresponds to 1291. The other one, former Nakamura collection in Japan, is less safe, probably based on the Inoue painting, a uh, kind of free copy maybe. Japanese artists would keep fumpon, or small study copies of paintings they had access to, and use these in doing new derivative works. Old compositions were perpetuated in this way. Next. The other genuine great painting by Urguan is the horizontal one that I showed near the end of the last lecture uh, of our first series. And I bring it back now, uh, the images of it here, to remind you. It not only has all the qualities that distinguish a fine Sung ink painting in ink values and in drawing that strike the nice balance between brush movement and representation, it also has a trustworthy inscription and seals of the artist. Next, please. Uh, leaf 55 represents a monkey on a horse and is ascribed to Zhao Yong, the son of Zhao Mengfu. A meaningless attribution again, made probably because Zhao Yun was another painter of horses. Next. The subject is especially interesting, however, uh, for its political implications, which are based on a kind of pun. Ma Shang Ho, excuse my pronunciation, meaning monkey on horse, sounds like Ma Chong Ho, or quickly become a marquis. Such a painting carried that is the wish that the recipient would soon rise to high rank in the bureaucracy. Uh, the heavy horizontal cracking on this painting means that it was once mounted as a hanging scroll, and such an auspicious painting would indeed have been displayed, not simply mounted in an album as it was later to be. The painting is hard to date, but it could be as early as late Sung. Next, please. I'll use two details to talk about the painting itself. We see now the spots of heavy white on the horse's hoofs and on its forefront. The horse is sleeping. The monkey definitely is not. He's smiling at us. The grasping position of the hand-like member at the end of his leg uh, uh, stretched along the horse's flank, where one would expect a, a, a simpler foot, is uh, strange and arresting. Is it simply a gesture of hanging on or grasping for something? The horse's mane is finely drawn, as is the whole image. Heavy horizontal cracking indicates that this picture was mounted as a hanging scroll for viewing before it was remounted as an album leaf. Perhaps its political implications that I outlined before account for this use of it as a, a for display. Next. Leaves 56 and 57 are both ascribed to the Yuan period flower painter, Wang Yuan, or Wang Rashui, a pupil of Zhao Mengfu who was active in Hangzhou and was a prolific painter, with quite a few of his works extant. Leaf 56 represents a dragonfly on a pea vine. I have no slide of it. Next. But here is another painting we saw earlier, similarly representing a dragonfly and a blossoming plant. This one with a false Shu Shi seal on it. Lovers of dragonflies are many. My own mother was one, and I could always please her with another small painting with a dragonfly in it, or a dragonfly pin, or anything else with a dragonfly. Next, please. And here's another fine painting with a dragonfly in it. This one with a reliable signature of Lin Chun. We've seen it before, of course, including also a grasshopper and a praying mantis on a grapevine. I have talked enough about the excellence of Sung Academy paintings of subjects of this kind, and I won't repeat the praise here 
especially because I have no good image of the heat go in leaf. Next, please. Leaf 57, the other one ascribed to Wang Yuan, of which I do have a good slide image, is titled Two Wagtails on Lotus, and depicts just that. I listed this one in my index as a work of the period, probably not by Wang Yuan. It's a pleasingly informal composition, giving the impression of a small scene glimpsed by chance. The lotus leaves and the blossoms are not arranged and presented in the usual way. The birds are nicely caught in mid-motion. The decaying of the leaves removes them from the usual common type. Someone writing about realism in Sun Ryan painting, a quite legitimate subject, by the way, however it might be prescribed by the big theory people, could use this as an example. The composition may not be as the artist originally intended. This may, that is, uh, be another fragment, say, from a larger painting. Next. For Leaf 58, which is attributed to the Ming artist Sun Lung and represents rabbits, called lubbits in the text leaf, Japanese are prone to mixing their R's and their L's. For this I have no slide, unhappily. I would like to be able to present this picture to the many rabbit lovers among my audience. My son Nicholas and my daughter-in-law Kay kept a rabbit in their apartment in Berkeley, and they probably have had more rabbits as they raised their girls. Four rabbits are depicted here, two of them eating some kind of stalk, and alas, I have nothing more to say about the picture. Next, please. Leaf 59 is attributed to Ma Kuei. Leaf 10 was also attributed to him, and you may remember that he was Ma Yuan's brother. This time, the composition looks especially interesting. The next, please. When we see it in a good image, it proves to be interesting indeed. It appears to be a narrative painting of the type that shows several incidents or episodes from the narrative, from the story, within the continuous space. Some scholar of Chinese literature may recognize what the story is. I can't. At the bottom, a man points the way over a bridge and upward to a woman companion, while two other men observe them from behind. At middle left, a man in a cart is pulled by a woman. Above this, beneath a curtain of clouds, we gaze into an interior to see a seated man confronting a woman with a servant behind him. Two details of this leaf, the upper and middle scenes, bring us closer to viewing the events in this narrative, but without, at least for me, allowing any identification of it. The first detail shows the, up, the open entryway to the house, with a man and woman facing each other inside, and a boy servant behind a screen at left. A large screen with calligraphy is behind them, this screen of the kind that is usually placed in entryways. It's similar to the one that was seen in the entryway of a previous leaf, which also showed two figures sitting inside with a servant. Bamboo grows outside, and a simple dirt path leads to openings in the brush brushwood fence. Next. That fence and the gate in it are seen at the top of this second detail. Uh, indi indicating that a continuous space is intended. Figures who look like rioting villagers waving sticks are coming down the slope. One of them turns to look at the party at the left, which must be the same man and woman now making their way away from the house, escaping from some danger, it would appear. With him in the cart, she pulling it, and two servants with luggage walking behind them. This may be a story about a virtuous woman who saves her husband from a riot. I don't seem to have a detail of the third episode at the bottom. How all this can be pulled into a story, I have, as I say, no idea. But it's a fascinating vision, a rare example of Chinese narrative painting from an early period, which I offer to Chinese literature specialists for them to puzzle over and perhaps read decisively. Again, heavy horizontal cracking indicates a previous mounting as a hanging scroll and, of course, this might be only part of a larger comp uh, complex of images, perhaps telling a bigger, a longer story. Next, please. The 60th and last leaf is attributed to the early Song artist Hui Chung, who, as you remember, was best known for landscapes with waterfowl, including geese. Next. And that is indeed what it is, a picture of a riverbank or a lakeshore 
with five geese, four of them seen whole and the fifth only as a head above the earth's slope. A few reeds in the lower right corner, and presumably some patterns in the water that are no longer discernible, complete the composition. It looks like a painting of Sung date, not in any identifiable style. I'll show a few other Sung Yuan paintings of geese from slides I made long ago in Japan for a comparison and to fill out the theme. If I were to choose now a painting to stand in for the work of Hui Chung, from whom no genuine work survive, it might be well be the one at left, which is indeed ascribed to him. It was owned by the Japanese dealer Mino, uh, who was mainly a ceramic dealer and had only a few old paintings, but good ones. His son, the younger Mino, studied in the U.S. and returned to Japan to become director of the Osaka Municipal Museum, where he may still be. The painting shows exactly the kind of sparse riverside landscape associated with Hui Chung, stretching at a distance with low, flat banks and few reeds growing from them, and geese along the water's edge. The other painting, which may be a fragment, the lower part of a similar larger composition, was owned by the Tokyo dealer Hei Sando, and shows geese, some in the water among reeds, some taking flight and disappearing, smaller and dimmer, in the upper right. Next, please. Two more, less refined, in ink only on silk. The one at left was owned by Yabumoto Sogoro, and shows geese on the river shore and in flight beneath tall bare trees. We saw two similar paintings in the same collection with buffalo and herd boys in similar settings. These may belong to a type or a regional style. The other one is cruder, with geese brought up closer. I have no record of who owned it. Next. There must be a section on geese in the book by Ho Mei Sung, a book I introduced in a previous lecture and recommend highly. Uh, her section on geese must have quotations from the Emperor Hui Zung's collection catalog, Xuan He Huapu, uh, telling the symbolism, the implications of paintings of geese. I don't have the book here and I don't remember enough to talk learnedly on that matter, so we can only look at the paintings. This one is a fan, another belonging to Yabumoto Sogoro, representing geese in the water, taking off and in flight. They are depicted with more differentiation by type and gender than usual, with markings and patterns. Also, the movements of the birds are observed and nicely transmitted by the unknown artist. This must have been, in its original form, a cooling fan to hold, to use, and to gaze at on hot summer days. And so ends this long two-part lecture on the Hit Goen album, probably the most talking ever devoted to a single Chinese album of paintings. My lectures are setting records for, if nothing else, long-windedness. But it's an album that raises a host of interesting questions and draws us into, into many areas where I can cite old research, including my own, or suggest directions of future research, as I have tried to do. Most of all, it exemplifies the importance, the fascination of that huge neglected area of Chinese painting that I call Sogenga, made up in large part of kinds of paintings admired and collected in Japan, but mostly scorned and lost in China. I hope that all of you have enjoyed the lecture and that some of you will be stimulated to look further into some of the topics it opens up. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.